Baptist background. There are, we've got 500 seats up here, and people seated all the way down the end of the aisle. <laughs> all right, we're ready to get started. All right, thank you, sir. Okay, why don't we pray? Father, thank you so much for the incredible grace and mercy that you pour in our lives. Thank you that um, when we ask for wisdom, you give us wisdom and you give us liberally. And we need wisdom, Lord. We need our hearts to be open to understand the truth of your word and the, the reality and the depth of your promises so that we will be solid in our faith and not wavering with every doctrine that floats by. So, Father, open up our hearts and help us to truly see Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've been talking about the laws that are placed in our minds and written on our heart through the New Covenant. These laws are based on the New Covenant. And one thing that I want to repeat a number of times is, is this idea of the New Covenant because there's a lot of confusion in Christendom about just what, what covenant we live under. A covenant is a promise. It is a declaration by God of how He's going to conduct Himself toward us what he's going to do. We talked about that a couple of sessions ago. And the covenant we now live under is the new covenant. The old covenant was the Mosaic law, the law that was given to the Jews. The Ten Commandments, the ceremonial law, the social law, everything that was written in, in, uh, in Exodus, Leviticus, and De Deuteronomy, that was the old law. It was a unilateral, I mean, a, a bilateral covenant, an if-then covenant. If you do this, good things will happen. If you don't do this, bad things will happen. And so it was based on works. And it's important to understand that we don't live under that covenant anymore because that covenant wasn't given for the purpose of demonstrating that man could fulfill all of those commands in order to prove man's righteousness to God. That covenant was given to demonstrate two things. The absolute perfection of God and the absolute imperfection of man. And that if we want to meet God on his terms, we can never do it in our own effort because we're common. He's holy. He's supernatural. We are not. We are finite. He's infinite. So we, there's no way that we can meet God on our terms. And so God had to come up with a way to bridge that gap so that we can meet God on God's terms. And he did that through Jesus. So... Uh, I want to. I want to go back. Can you can you pull up the Hebrews ten again? I just want to go through the new covenant again. So everybody, I want you to. I want you to remember this. The, the 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 new covenant is in Jeremiah, but it's reiterated in Hebrews eight. It's summarized in Hebrews ten, but in Hebrews eight through twelve is the new covenant, and in the new and it basically says this. There we go. Okay. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Now, a lot of people go, well, how does that apply to us? Are we people of Israel? Are we people of Judah? Well, the people in Israel are people of Judah. Everyone would agree are children of Abraham, right? Israel was populated by the children of Abraham. Well, Galatians, I believe it's 3.8 says, Those who are of faith, our children of Abraham. So that new covenant applies to us if we believe in Jesus. So you might want to make a note of that if you, if you want that kind of reference because if somebody wants to argue, about what, argue with you about that, you can say, look, I'm a child of Abraham according to what Paul wrote in Galatians because he said those who are of faith are children of Abraham. I'll read it to you. Actually, it's uh, Hebrews, I'm sorry, Galatians 3, 7. Know you therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. The New, the New Living Translation makes it a little clearer. The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. So if this new covenant that we, I want to put that back up there. If this new covenant God is making with Judah and Israel, in effect God is making with those who believe in Christ. So he makes this covenant with them and here's what he says. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, right? That's the Exodus. That's the 
That's the Moses, the Ten Commandments story. Because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. What is he saying there? They didn't remain faithful to his covenant, not that they, didn't, not that they couldn't keep the law perfectly. They quit believing. See, he knew they couldn't keep the law. That's why there were sacrifices within the new covenant. If you sinned, you, you gave a sin offering. So, see, he didn't give the law for them to keep it. We'll find out later what he gave the law for, but let's finish this. And here's what he says. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will, know, they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. So what God is saying is a couple of things here. One is, you don't have to come to me and offer sacrifices for sin. There's one sacrifice that's now been made for all man. That's Jesus Christ, been crucified one time, shed his blood, paid the sin debt for all men, past, present, and future. And anybody who believes in Christ and accepts that, their sins are forgiven forever. So we are forgiven for the sins we're going to commit tomorrow. And then he says this, and this is the amazing thing. You remember God used to live in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant was. Now he lives in our heart. So his Holy Spirit now writes on our minds and hearts the, what he's calling his law. And so the question that we're trying to answer is, well, what laws does he put in our mind? What laws does he write on our heart? And we talked about last session that the first law that he writes on our hearts is the law of love, right? The very, the very most important commandment God actually writes on our heart. In fact, um, in Romans chapter 5, it says, uh, it says this. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works patience, patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope makes not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts. The very first law that God writes on our hearts is how much he loves us. Remember we talked about last session that Jesus indicted the Pharisees because he said, you don't believe that I'm sent from the Father because the love of the Father is not in you. See, love doesn't originate with us. It originates with God and he writes it in our hearts. So that's the first law. So the, the idea of this new covenant is God wants us to not be focused on a ceremonial law or, or a ritual the law that God gave to Moses was not designed to be kept. It was designed to show us his perfection. And according to Paul, Paul says this, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to no sin except through the law. The law showed you what was right and what was wrong. Therefore, you had a knowledge of sin. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. See, the law was only sent to show us how imperfect we are and to show us when we were violating the righteousness, the holiness of God. In fact, Paul even says over in Galatians, 324, that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law taught us our desperate plight. The law taught us that we needed a redeemer for our, for our perfection because we could not perfect ourselves. And God now does that through the new covenant. And the new covenant is what we just read. Why did God now say, I will remember their uh, I will for, I will uh, I will forgive their uh, their sins and and not remember their lawless deeds. Why does he say that? Because Jesus came, according to uh, Corinthians, he who knew no sin became sin so that we could be the righteousness of God. Jesus is the righteousness of God. We're sinners. We are worthy only of judgment. 
But God loves us enough where He wanted to pay the price for our sin, redeem us, that is, purchase us by His blood so that we can now be His righteousness. So Jesus took all our bad, gave us all His good. So now we're justified before God because of what Jesus did. That's what the law was intended to do. So the, we're now down to another law that God writes on our hearts. We talked about the law of love. What, what other law do you think God writes on our heart? Why don't we pull that up? It's called the law of faith. In Romans 3, 27, 28, it says this. Where is the boasting then? Is it excluded by what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. What's he saying? He said, you're not justified before God by what you do. Works of the law. You are justified before God by faith. Now, what we're going to be talking about tonight is, what is faith? Because, again, this is a foundation series. As Christians, we throw around words thinking everybody knows what they mean. And oftentimes, if we, we may think we know what it means, and we may be completely in error. Or we may not even know what it means at all. So what we're going to be talking about tonight is, what exactly is faith? What is it that... What, what, what is this faith thing that God puts in our mind and writes in our heart? What is faith? Anybody want to take a crack at it before we dig in? Believing something you can't see. Believing something you can't see. You're quoting uh, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Actually, it's uh, Hebrews 11.3. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We're going to get into that scripture later. What does that mean? Actually, we're going to break that scripture down because that's confusing, isn't it? Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What does that mean? Is she right? Anybody else got a definition? What is faith? That's why we're here, I guess, huh? Find out. Okay. Well... Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. It's the scripture you were talking about. That seems rather mystical, doesn't it? Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. The King James says, Faith is the substance of the things we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So, we're to have confidence God will give us what we hope for. We're, we're to be assured of receiving what we cannot see. So, I mean, to unpack that, we're going to have to go through some discussions about what faith is, and we're going to have to talk a little bit about what faith is not. See, faith is not simply desiring something and expecting to get it. That's not what faith is. Now, there's a certain aspect of desire that's associated with faith. But look, God's not a cosmic vending machine. I mean, there may be things that we want to believe God will give us and we desire deeply, but it would violate, it would violate the character of God. I mean, for example, God might not fire your boss just because he's hard on you and to make it easier for you on the job. But he might give your boss a promotion. And, you know, he might uh, teach you how to walk in peace and produce in you the fruit of patience. He might do it that way. He might not answer a prayer for a soldier to die in battle so a guy can date his girlfriend. But he might bring the lady that the guy needs into his life and show him how covetousness is blinding. You know, God might not let you win the lottery if you're going to spend all the money as a drug addict. But he might show you what his peace is really about so you can walk in prosperity and health and peace 
and at the same time show you that the most important gift that you can get from God is not money but Him and to be content in all things. So see, desiring alone is not faith because sometimes we desire things that, that if God answered our prayer, we wouldn't really want. It would be harmful to us. And we need to understand that you know, when we want things from God, we, we, we do know that He says He gives us in abundance. He gives us beyond what we could hope or imagine. He'll, he gives us blessings we cannot contain. All the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. But He gives them to us in, in ways where, in the same time, He's teaching us how to be responsible. And He's teaching us how to be mature. And He's teach us, teaching us how to be selfless when He gives. That's, that's how God gives in abundance. So another thing, you know, we're told to just have faith. How many times have you heard that? Just have faith. Well, what does that mean? I mean, that kind of a statement suggests that we can just uh, conjure up from the inside a strong enough ethereal force that it will just happen. But you know, that kind of faith takes God completely out of the equation. We don't have the ability to produce anything out of nothing like God does. And we can't produce what we want by conjuring up faith of ourselves. It comes from God. Or what about this? Well, this is my faith. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, this is my package of beliefs. Well, how did you come about those beliefs? Well, I don't know. Family, tradition, the pulpit, Sunday school. It feels good. <laughs> You know, my faith is not faith unless my faith is a devotion to having confidence that Jesus is going to do everything that he promised. So we need to understand those things that aren't faith so we have a little clearer understanding of what faith really is. See, the faith in the Bible is the, the confidence, that faith that moves mountains is the confidence that God will do exactly what he said he was going. That's faith. When God, you know, we're going to read a little later on, we call it the hall of faith. All the, all the people listed in, in Hebrews chapter 11 where they were justified by their faith, what they did by faith. But you know what God wants more than anything from us? He wants us to believe that He is as good as He says He is. He wants us to believe Him for everything that we need and desire. In fact, He even wants us to believe Him for our desires. He wants us to completely rest and live in Him. That's what pleases God. He who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. He wants us to believe who He is. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, the opposite of that must be true then. Right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. If we believe His promises, that must please God. And it does please God. So it's even more important that we understand and know what are the promises of God so that when circumstances come along, the Holy Spirit can quicken one of those promises to our mind and faith will arise and we can trust God to give us peace in that situation or give us health in that situation or give us guidance or wisdom or whatever we need, boldness. But if we don't know the promises of God, we don't know what to believe in. We just believe God. Well, believe God for what? So, I mean, what, can, what are some of the promises of God? Look, we can believe that Jesus was sent by the Father because of his love for us to shed his blood so that there would be a sacrifice for our sins. We can believe without question that our sins are forgiven and we are justified before God. We can believe that because of the imputation of Jesus' righteousness, that is me giving you this, imputing to you, giving it to you, by the imputation of Jesus' righteousness, we are righteous in the eyes of the Father. We can believe, trust completely that we are heirs of God and joint heirs of Jesus Christ. We inherit the kingdom. All these things that God created, He owns. And guess what? His children get. We're heirs of God, join heirs with Jesus Christ. We get the universe. 
I don't know what it's going to be like in eternity. But I do know that there's going to be, for example, supernatural transport. I mean, there's a story in the book of Acts where Philip was transported from the Ethiopian eunuch all the way on the other side of Israel. Just like that. That's better than Star Trek. I mean, that's going to be fun flying around heaven. You know, from galaxy to galaxy. And I mean, I, can't, I can only imagine what it's going to be like when we're living in eternity and we're not bound by fallen human bodies. It's going to be fascinating. I mean, we are heirs of the creator of the universe. His kingdom is unlimited. I mean, you stop and think about it. Even the richest man in the world, whoever that might be, his kingdom is limited. I mean, his heirs, they may have what seems to be an inexhaustible supply of inheritance, but believe me, it's exhaustible. God's is not. And because he's a creative God, we're probably not going to do many of the same things twice. It's going to be constant newness. Completely in completely entrenched in his love all at the same time. I think that's why Paul was able to say, hey, to live as Christ, to die is gain. If I'm here, I live in Christ. If I'm there, I live in pure goodness, pure love for eternity. So I'm good either way. And I'll tell you something, when you look at it that way, that's how... The grave loses its victory. That's how death loses its sting. We don't have to be afraid of death. It's just transitioning into better. I think that's why Paul said to Timothy, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind and strength and love. So whether we're here or whether we're there, we're good. That's why we, can't, that's why we don't need to be walking around in fear. Anyway, so... Faith is to believe what God promises and act on that fact that He will manifest them in our life even if it doesn't seem to be happening when faith is exercised. Faith is believing what we cannot see as if it is really there. It's the very substance of what we hope for, although we may not see it yet. So, Faith is the confidence in what we hope for, the assurance of, about what we don't see. The King James uses the word substance instead of confidence. That word substance um, is the Greek word hypostatus. It's a compound word that means confidence or to stand under as a foundation. It is the support for whatever is on it. Kenneth Woost, the Greek scholar, wrote a Bible, uh, translated a New Testament, about what, how it would read in, in Greek vernacular today. And he said that this word substance, this word confidence, is the title deed. So to read this verse in the Greek vernacular, it would read like this. Faith is the title deed of the things hoped for, the proof of things which are not being seen. So see, when we have a title deed, you guys get older and you, you, know, you, you buy your own house, what you're going to get that proves you own that house is a deed. And it's a deed that's filed with the county clerk in the deed records office and it tells the whole world that you own that property. The title deed. That is your assurance of your ownership. Just like you get a title to a car. It's proof to everybody. It's legal proof you own that car. Faith is the proof of what we hope for. It's the evidence of it. It's the title deed. I want to talk a little bit about Abraham because, you know, God said that Abraham believed and it was imputed to him as righteousness. Abraham had faith. Abraham believed what God told him. In fact, in Galatians 3.8, um, it says that the gospel was preached to Abraham. So when God cut the covenant with Abraham, God preached the gospel to him, just like we've had the gospel preached to us, and Abraham believed. And God said that was attributed to him as righteousness. You mean all he had to do was believe and he's righteous in the eyes of God? 
Or did God somehow make him perfect and he was no longer a sinner and that made him right before God? Guys, Abraham sinned. Right? Y'all know some of the things he did, right? He told Pharaoh that Sarah, his wife, was his sister. He also t told King uh, uh, Abimelech, I believe it was. Same thing. Now, technically speaking, Sarah was his half-sister. But he lied because he was scared. He didn't want Pharaoh killing him to take Sarah for his wife, so he called her his sister. But God, when he made this promise to Abraham that he was going to have a son through whom he would have descendants as countless as the stars and the sands of the sea, and he would have his heirs would bless every nation on the earth. He understood that to be Jesus. That's how the gospel was preached to him. God made this promise to Abraham when he was 75 years old. And his barren wife, Sarah, who hadn't had any children, was 65 years old. God makes him a promise. You're going to have a son. That's where, if you ever heard the term, the son of promise, that's, that's what that means, is that God promised Abraham that he was going to have a natural born son who was the son of his promise, through whom all the nations of the world would be blessed. So 10 years passed. Nothing happened. Abraham's 85. Sarah's 75. And the clock's a ticking. Nothing's happening. You know what? They started to doubt. Hey, I don't doubt that God's going to give me a son, but how's he going to pull this off? Are we supposed to be doing something about this? <laughs> I mean, you can imagine what was going on through in their mind. You know, and it wasn't unexpected, and it's not unusual to second-guess God, especially when things aren't happening as fast as you think they ought to happen. And you can, hear, you can hear Sarah just thinking, you know, God has promised a son to end my shame in not being able to conceive. In that culture, it was shameful if a woman could not have a baby, especially if she didn't have a son. So she's thinking, uh, God said out of Abraham he will make a great nation and the families of the world will be blessed. Now I'm 75, I'm too old to have children. I'm barren anyway. How in the world is God going to do this? Maybe God was speaking figuratively. Maybe he wants us to do something about it. Now, I've got a servant girl over here. Her name is Hagar, and she's fertile. Let me give her to Abraham. He can, he can be with her, and she can conceive a child, and bing, bang, boom, the child of promise is there, right? Right? Problem solved, promise fulfilled. Yes? No. No. God had a different plan. Hagar did get pregnant. She had a son called him Ishmael. The book of Galatians calls him the son of the bondservant, basically a symbolism of being trapped in legalism. But Ishmael was not the son of promise because that son wasn't brought about by God's promise. That son was brought about by man's works. Man's efforts to bring about what God wants to bring. And when we survey history, we find man's works is always antithetical, always at opposition to what God wants to do. Because man's works that are not inspired by the Holy Spirit militate against faith. Because faith says, I trust God to do it. Work says, I'm going to show God that I can. I can do it. I got this, God. And I want to tell you, according to Isaiah, our righteousness in the eyes of a holy God is like filthy rags. The little interpretation is like used toilet paper. That's what God thinks of our works. That's what he thinks of our righteousness. But he thinks highly of Jesus' righteousness, and thank goodness his righteousness has been imputed to me. That's why when God looks at me, we'll find out later that I'm justified by faith because of that imputation of righteousness that Jesus gave. So, 
Here's the deal. I mean, let's, let's analyze this. Ishmael, right, was their son. He was the substance of things they, they hoped for, right? He was the substance of what they were hoping for. They were hoping for a son because God promised them a son. And there was a promise from God that they would have a son. And there was no visible evidence of what they were hoping for because Sarah was barren. I mean, all the components of Hebrews 11.1 1 was there. Why did God not recognize Ishmael as the son of promise? See, they didn't doubt the promise. They doubted the manner in which God was going to do it. They, and by doing that, they took God out of the equation by trying to bring, out the, bring about the promise themselves. Sometimes we just have to wait and trust God when he says he'll do it, he'll do it. But he's going to do it in his time. I had somebody tell me one time, he said, you know, God is, God is seldom early, but he's never late. He will do what he wants to do, and he will fulfill his promises exactly at the right time. And since we can't see around corners, we don't know what that right time is. That's why we're supposed to just trust him. That's why we're supposed to have faith. The confidence that even though we're doubting, and even though it doesn't look like it, and even like it looks like it's even getting worse, God is still going to do what He promised He would do. That's faith. So they take God out of the equation, and they devise this scheme to have a child, and they call it Him bringing it about. They intervened, and they failed. You know what? God is so faithful that even their intervention that gummed up everything didn't stop the promise of God. By the way, you know what happened? God told Hagar that Ishmael would be a wild donkey of a man and he would be at enmity with everybody. He'd be at odds with everybody. He's basically the father of the Arabs, the Islams, the people who, who believe in Islam. And they, they've been chucking rocks at each other for 2,000 years. They can't get along with anybody. They can't get along with themselves. That is the offshoot of man's efforts to bring about the promises of God. Well, what happens? God goes, okay, I give up. I know you are trying. That was a big mistake, but I'm just going to, okay. You, no, 15 more years pass. Abraham is 99, Sarah is 90, 89. And the angel of the Lord appears to Abraham and he says, this time next year you're going to have a son. And Abraham's like, you know, I already got a son. You know, I got Ishmael, he's 13, why don't you just go ahead and, 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 and bless him? And the Lord's like, no, he's not the son of the promise. When they heard God say at that age that they were going to have a son, you know what Sarah did? She laughed. And God's like, she laughing? No, 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 I'm not laughing. Guess what? A year later, a barren woman had a son. You know what she called him? Laughter. That's Isaac. That's what his name means. God's got a sense of humor. Okay, you don't believe me? Well, you don't have a son. And you're going to call him Laughter. Abraham believed God would give him a son. He just struggled with the manner in which God said he would bring it about. But despite the natural impossibility and his own reasoning to the contrary, he had a son. The Lord reassured Abraham of the promised son. And God said this about Abraham. Abraham didn't say, Abraham, you failed, you didn't believe, you gave up, you got weak need in mid-game, and you, you, know, you walked off the field. Nope, God said, Abraham chose to believe, and it was attributed to him as righteousness. There was no substance to that reality except the belief that God would fulfill his promise. And that belief was evident in the promise, because he believed. Abraham didn't see the evidence of the promise for 25 years. You know, I... Uh, <clears throat> um, I was 28 years old when I got married to Hope. She was 21. 
And I remember praying for her uh, from the day I got saved. I started praying for my wife because I wanted God to bring the wife that I wanted. And I prayed for her, obviously, for 10 years. I got saved when I was 18. I prayed for her for 10 years. And I didn't see her for 10 years. But I knew her when I saw her. I knew her the moment that I saw her who she was. So I tell my wife that, and I think, that's romantic to tell her, right? She goes, that's kind of perverted. I mean, you're praying for, you're praying for me when I was 12? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't really looking at it that way. <laughs> Sometimes it takes longer than we might hope or we might expect for God to fulfill his promise. But guys, will. So faith is the substance of the, uh, the things we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. What does hope mean? Hope. What is hope? Well, what is our primary hope? What is our great hope? The return of Jesus, right? Our great hope is Jesus Christ, the glory of our Lord. He comes, he gets us in the twink of an eye, we change, and we will know him as he is because we'll be like him. We'll be be operating in those supernatural bodies. Which, by the way, you can feel. When Jesus walked through the wall after his resurrection, he looked just like Jesus. And even still had the holes in his hands and the holes in his feet. And he could eat. But he could walk through walls and could disappear. There were some added features. There were some updates <laughs> to, his, to his resurrected body. I'm hoping one of those updates is hair. <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> the word for hope is elpis in the, in the Greek. Hope, uh, it doesn't mean wishing for something uh, for which there's a great desire, but only a remote possibility of happening. I mean, one might wish to eat ice cream and pizzas all you want without gaining weight (laughs) or leap tall buildings in a single bound, but that's not hope. I mean, those kind of longings are just, uh, they're far-fetched desires. Elpis means a confident expectation that God will fulfill His promises. That's what hope is. So faith is the title deed of the confident expectation that God will do what he said. So how do you, how do you, how do you distinguish confident expectation from just desire? Well, you know the promise of God. Is if, if he says, my peace I leave with you, it's not a peace that the world gives, it's a peace that I give. My peace... Be anxious for nothing but through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. That is a promise of God. And we can have a confident expectation that when we are in times of high anxiety, if we just step back and go, Lord, I need your peace, that his peace will be there. And it will not only be there, but it will guard our hearts and minds so that we don't get anxious and get afraid and get confused. I mean, how do you, how do you like the idea that God himself is guarding your hearts and minds? I mean, it's fascinating, really, when you stop and think about his promises. My peace, I, I leave you. Or how about the joy of the Lord is my strength? Really? His joy is my strength. All right, I like this one. How about he's made strong in my weakness? He does not lambast me because I'm, I fail in things. When I fail, those are moments when I have opportunities to trust him and it glorifies him because I'm believing him. And in doing that, he demonstrates to me that he lifts me up and he delivers me and it glorifies his name. It demonstrates his strength in my weakness. God, you know, our, uh, this hope in God is a confident expectation he'll fulfill his promises. I mean, we confidently, ex- confidently expect he will re- reveal more of Jesus to us. You can have confidence that he wants you to know more about Jesus. He wants you to really understand the depth, the height, the breadth, the width of the love that he has for us. And guess what? The height and the depth and the breadth and the width of the love that he has for us, it's infinite. 
It doesn't have limits. That's how much He loves us. There is no limitation to God's love. And He wants us to know those kind of things. And we, He wants us to have the confident expectation in it that He will reveal that to us. We can confidently expect that the Lord will meet all of our needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Then He say, consider the birds of the field. They never, neither, they neither toil nor spin, yet Solomon in all of his glory was not robed like they are. Aren't you more valuable than many sparrows? He loves us. And he'll provide for our needs. We get anxious, and I, I, sometimes I wonder why. It's like, okay, is it just because... Well, I'll give you an example of something that happened to me. I was a young Christian. I remember standing in front of the mirror shaving, and I was thinking about five years ahead. Because I tend to think kind of long term, at least I used to. And I heard this little voice inside that says, quit craning over that. And being from, you know, East Texas, the only crane that I knew was a bird or a machine. And, I, and they were both nouns. I didn't have an idea of what craning even meant. I dropped my razor. I didn't even wash my face off. I grabbed my Webster's Dictionary, opened it up, looked to work the word craning. And the word craning means like a long-legged stork. You're standing there, but your neck is stretched way out over, and you're looking over there, and you're not even seeing where you're standing. I mean, sometimes I think we get anxious because we're impatient about what's going to come, and we're really not stopping and smelling the roses along the way. We're not enjoying the journey. We're just looking at a destination. But see, every day, is, every day is a Sabbath day, so God wants us to rest in every day, meaning he wants us to enjoy every moment, every, every day, and not be troubled about tomorrow. We can confidently expect God will give us his peace. Didn't we just talk about peace? That word in Hebrew is shalom. In fact, when you go to Israel... A very common greeting is shalom. And you know how they respond? Actually, they'll go, shalom, shalom, which is peace right back at you. Well, shalom means health, prosperity, and peace. See, we, we've, we've religiousized God to the point where we think God doesn't really have much of an impact in our physical world. It's all spiritual. Well, it's very difficult to spiritualize when, when Peter said he's the God that heals us. It's very difficult to spiritualize when there's a man with a withered hand and Jesus says, stretch forth your hand and his hand stretches forth and he's healed. It's hard to spiritualize when a man's been paralytic and unable to walk for 38 years and Jesus says, get up, take up your bed and walk. It's hard to spiritualize that. The man was physically healed by Jesus. And he still wants that to happen in our life. If we will believe him, that he wants us whole, spirit, soul, and body. I love the psalm that says, God will restore our youth. You know, the, the, the flip side of that is the world's view of it. You know, that life is wasted on youth. So, you know, now I'm old enough to have means and experience and wherewithal and everything. I'm just too tired. <laughs> God wants to restore our youth. So we won't be... I, unfortunately, there's a lot of you that can relate to that, right? <laughs> we confidently expect to receive Zoe life. Zoe life is the fullness of life that flows from God. How did you get your life? God breathed life into man. Life comes from God. And the depth of life that comes from God is a lot, a lot deeper than just an animated, like you know, a dog or a bird or an animal or something. Life in the sense that we can experience what God has made the way that God experiences. I mean, we are made in the image of God. The life that flows from God is what he wants us to experience. By the way, is God sick? Is God poor? Is he depressed? Is he anxious? Is he 
despondent? Is he betrayed? Is he outcast? No. His life is full as full can be. That's the kind of life he wants us to have. That's the kind of life he gives us. We can have that confident expectation. We don't have to doubt any of the withholding of these promises. We're confident he will manifest these things in our life. That's what this hope means, that he will. And we have the confident expectations. What does he mean when he says what we don't see? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Meaning, we've got all this evidence going on and all this hope going on about something that we can't see. Thomas said, I'll believe it when I see it. So Jesus appeared and said, Thomas, look. Put your hand on my hands. Put your hand on my side. You believe because you've seen. Blessed is he who believes who has not seen. Just because Thomas didn't see it didn't mean it was any less true. Thomas could have believed without seeing, but he refused. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Just because we can't see it doesn't mean God's still not going to do it. Describe for me what wind looks like. Well, then it must not be there. Well, you can see the effects of wind, but can you see wind? Can you see a radio wave? No, then it must not exist. Why do we choose to disbelieve God because we can't see him when there are so many things in this world that we believe that we can't see? Living in the country, I don't have cable. We have a satellite receiver. And the stuff that we get on our TV is sent from someplace in the world to a satellite 100 miles up in the air and comes back down to us. I can't see any of that going up or coming down until it's manifested on my TV screen but I believe it. We have so many things in our world that, 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 that we do, that we keep believing that we can't see, and yet we doubt the existence of God because we can't see Him. Look, we need to understand that faith transcends our carnality. Our carnality is bound by our senses, what we can see, touch, taste, hear, smell, feel. But I want to tell you, God is not limited in communicating to us in just those senses. That's carnality. That's how we're limited. God's not limited. And you know what? Our senses, are fool, they'll, they'll fool us. Our senses are not comprehensive of per- perceptive perception. God can communicate with us beyond our senses. Have you ever noticed there's some people that say, no, I, I think something bad's about to happen. <laughs> and it happens. That's something that transcends our senses, right? And our senses, our senses will, will fool us. Um, you ever notice that the, the wheels on a moving vehicle look like they're going in the opposite direction than the vehicle's going? So you really can't rely on your eyes sometimes. Um, have you ever been looking down a, a road on a hot day and it looks like it's water out there, a mirage? There's no water out there, but it looks like water, right? Our eyes are fooling us. Do you know that water of the same temperature can feel hot or cold, depending on how hot or cold you are? Have you ever had your hands really, really cold, almost frostbitten, and you run them under cold water, and that cold water feel hot? We can't trust our senses, guys. The word bad can mean a compliment or something that's bad. We can't believe everything we hear. The smell of certain foods can make your stomach rumble or make you nauseated, maybe depending on an experience you had in the past. We can't rely on that either. You know what? Is a Coke sweet? Is a Coke sweet after you eat a Snickers? No, you can't taste the sugar at all, can you? We can't taste our taste buds. We can't trust our taste buds either. My point is that we live in a world where we rely entirely on our senses and we limit ourselves because God is much greater than our senses. 
His promises are vastly greater than our senses. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Can you see the word of God? Can you see it? But he says that's more, that's more substantial than heaven and earth. Look at it this way. What's more substantial, you or fog? Or look at it this way. If you're standing in fog, does the fog pass through you or do you walk through the fog? Which is more substantial? Yes, and we need to understand that the Word of God is more substantial than what we believe. It's more substantial than what we sense. We need to understand that those promises are so rock solid that heaven and earth is going to pass away and those promises will still exist because they're the Word of God. That's how substantial the Word of God is. And we can have that confident hope, that confident expectation in those promises even though we can't see them. God wants us to, to trust Him despite our senses. Our senses are fickle. But His promises are more certain and established in our senses. Some days we might not feel like the righteousness of God. But we are just as much the righteousness of God on those days as the days where we feel like we are. Some days we may feel like God doesn't really care about us. But you know what? It's probably those days where the grace of God and the mercy of God is more extended to you to show you just how much He does care. Some days we may not think we're favored by God because we didn't get that promotion. But God probably has something better planned for us because we're highly favored by God. We just have to know that. If we believe Him when we do not see what we're hoping for, it promotes, it promotes trust in Him. Trusting God pleases God. Hebrews 11.6 says this, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to God to Him must believe that He is and that He exists and He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. How do you please God? You just simply trust Him. You mean that's it? I don't have to go and evangelize my neighborhood. I don't have to come to church every Sunday. I don't have to pray an hour a day, read my Bible an hour a day. Correct. All that's good for you. But if you're doing it for the wrong motivation, then it's distracting you from faith. I mean, we're all old enough to know that two people can do exactly the same thing and one of them be wrong and one of them be right. How can that be? Because one is motivated by the right thing and one is motivated by the wrong thing. In fact, don't you remember the story in Acts where Ananias and Sapphira, they were, the, the, the people were coming forward, they were selling their property, they were giving them as alms to the, to, the, to the disciples, and the disciples were distributing as was needed. And Ananias and Sapphira came, sold their property, gave some of the money, but they kept some of it. Ananias comes up to give it to Peter, and, and, and Peter says, you have lied to the Holy Ghost, and he fell over dead. Sapphira came in later, Peter said, the same guys that carry in and I said, I'm going to carry you out. And she dropped over dead. Why? Wasn't, weren't they doing the same thing everybody else was doing? Weren't they giving their alms? Weren't they trying to support everybody? Yeah. But they were doing it for the wrong reason. So yeah, we know that, that God inspires works. That's how we have a desire to go out and share the gospel with people. It's because we're so enamored with His love, we can't contain it, and it's bubbling over, and we just want to tell people about the love of Jesus. That's inspiration. But if we're going out telling people about Jesus because we're afraid God's going to judge us if we don't, or He's going to reward us if we do, that's the wrong motivation. And the Bible says that's going to burn away like wood, hay, and stubble. It has no effect in the eyes of holy. 
So yeah, works are important, but they're important for the right reason. So without, without faith, there is no title deed to the promise and no hope. God wants us to trust Him and walk in the assurance of His promises. In doing so, we please Him. When we please Him, we see His faithfulness because He's faithful to us. When we see His faithfulness, our faith grows and we receive what we ask because we can trust Him because we've seen Him do it. So where does this faith come from? I mean, we know, for example, that we aren't the authors of love, so love doesn't come internally from us. Where does faith come from? Do we conjure that up too? Do you know faith is a gift? We don't have to worry about getting it. God gives it to us. It's a gift from God. Romans 12.3 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. God gives us faith. When there's a moment in need to believe, we believe. He gives it to us. Now, we have a choice to believe. He gives us the faith to believe. We have a choice to exercise that faith or a choice to reject it. But God gives it when it's needed. See, He doesn't require us to spend something we don't have. He gives it to us. That's what's so cool about the new covenant. It's unilateral. Everything's up front. We don't earn any of it. We just get it. We get all of the promises, none of the curses. If you want to compare it to the law, read Deuteronomy 28. Like 56 verses of all curses. Well, not all of them. I think the first 14 verses are the promises. The rest of it are curses if you don't do the law. Colossians tells me that Jesus nailed the law to the cross. So now we no longer have the curses. We just have the blessings. That's the cool thing about the new covenant. So he expects us to fully utilize the faith he gives, and he does that by faithfully protecting us, delivering us, blessing us until our faith grows and grows and grows, and we just want to trust him more. And so when we see and experience the boundless power of God, Extend it to us over and over again. It builds our trust in Him. Our faith grows. And we learn more and more that He can do anything. And if He can do anything, we trust Him for bigger and bigger things. You know, C.S. Lewis said this. He said, you know, we're not guilty of asking God for too big of things. We're, gu we're guilty of asking Him for too little. We serve a big God. A big God. You know... Jesus laid some pretty serious charges against some cities who had seen his miracles and chose not to believe. Here's what he said. Then he began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. What does that mean? They didn't turn back to God. They didn't believe him. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you... They would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? <clears throat> you'll, be, you'll, be, you'll descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which had occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. See, Jesus didn't condemn those people for not being able to generate their own faith. He condemned them because they refused to believe him after he did the miracles among them. He showed them that he could be trusted, and they still didn't believe. That's why he condemned them. He didn't condemn them for not having enough faith. He didn't condemn them for not being able to generate it. What he did would have given anybody faith, and they didn't believe anyway. So we don't need to fret. God will give us the faith we need. God, 1 Corinthians 1, 9 says, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So even in those times that we don't have the faith that we think we need, we can rest on the fact that God is still faithful. We can have faith in the promises in His Word. For He says again, heaven and earth will pass away, but my Word will never pass away. So whether we need peace or joy, 
faith or healing or favor or wisdom or prosperity. He is faithful to keep his promises to give us those things we need. His calling is true. We can trust his faithfulness even when our faith falters. So let me just give you a quick survey of what faith, what people are able to do by faith. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. By, by faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to, to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heirs of the righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. Through faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, to conceive a child. These all died in faith, not having received the promise. What's the promise? Jesus. But having seen them afar and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They believed and they didn't see. They were waiting for Jesus to come. We now have Jesus. How much more should we believe? We live in a time that is the end time. It is the latter rain. God is pouring out on us blessings that we cannot contain. And we choose, sadly, especially in the Bible Belt, to choose religion over relationship with God. In a time that He wants to reveal more and more of His Son to us. Well, thank God He's opening our hearts. Thank God He's giving us the power to receive. You know, even that is a gift from God. Even believing more, trusting more, all that comes from God. He wants us I love the last, I believe it's the last chapter of, uh, of uh, Malachi. It says that in the end times, God will restore the hearts of the father back to the children. And I believe that's what God's doing is that he, you know, Jesus brought about the reconciliation of creation to God. And it's being reconciled every day. God is reconciling creation back to himself. He's drawing us to him. All we need to do is receive him. Amen. Before we pray, do we have any questions? Small groups, so guys, feel free. Is here to answer any question we got. No questions? Silent questions? Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the incredible wisdom that's in your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you open up the word and you show us how alive. The Word of God really is how quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Able to separate the very bone from the, bone from the marrow, the soul from the spirit. Open our eyes. As, as, as Paul prayed in Ephesians, open the eyes of our understanding that we may truly see you, Jesus. And give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation of knowledge of who you are. Who we are in you. What is the inheritance of the saints and the power that is usward when we believe? In Jesus' name, amen.